Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric. I'm here with Michael Kester. Hey there. And uh, we're talking about two films today on the show. Yes. We have, uh, I guess, kind of an unorthodox relationships day. Yeah, that's on a good way. Double of feature. It. Sure. It's also going to be a little bit of a, a make Eric super uncomfortable episode mm, of that's double a good feature. One. I like that. We didn't talk about that before the show, but I'm not really sure what to do about that. Okay. We'll we'll get to that. I guess I'll just kind of figure that's that on out. You. As we go, what movies are we doing today? Today we're going to do Catfish and the Girlfriend Experience, starring your your <laughs> web browser's history's very own Sasha Gray. So I want to say this up front about these two movies, because uh, as always, people, they listen to the show and then they watch the movies, which uh-huh. turns out is not the correct order yeah, to do this whole experience. We do it in. the opposite way, and we were kind of expecting everybody else would, too. That would be better, right? Right. So watch Catfish and right. watch The Girlfriend Experience yes, and then listen to the show. In that order. Uh, maybe you don't have to watch The Girlfriend Experience. We're going we're gonna to go with Experimental. Does that sound good? Sure, watch it. I'm just going to keep throwing that I down. feel like everybody, we watch it, so fuck yeah. you, watch it. <laughs> right. Right, well, some people still have this idea that we watch movies so they don't have to. We watch it for them? Yeah, I don't know. Oh, right, because they just put out the cliff notes on the girlfriend experience in Catfish just the other day. There's no substitute for the show? Is that what you're trying to tell I'd, me? Yeah, we're an absolute viable piece of the internet. Well, look, most of the times I'll say watch both of the movies. And I don't think that's any less true here. But I really want to emphasize that people should watch Cat. I mean, really want to emphasize that. Mm-hmm. But look, here's why. If you listen to us talk about the girlfriend experience... And then you go watch the movie. I don't feel like anything is lost. No, probably that, gained. Uh, that film watching endeavor there. But if you were to say, listen to us talk about Catfish, I mean, it's the kind of movie I think, and, and this is what I love about our show, to be completely honest. After I saw Catfish, I went out on the internet looking for a conversation between two people about Catfish. Uh-huh. Because after you see it, you kind of want that. And you can find lots of reviews that are like that, but you can't find a lot of people. You just have so many fucking questions. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. You want to know all these things. You, especially if you see it by yourself, Mm -hmm. then you're just thinking, well, what the hell happened? Right. Whereas if you were to listen to us talk about Catfish, one that's going to ruin an experience Mm -hmm. you'll never be able to have again, seeing that movie for yourself for the first time. Right. And then the the second is that the conversation we're actually going to have won't be, you know, one one hundredth as good. Yeah. You won't have any idea what we're talking mushy about. Mushy cod, just mushy cod. The only purpose it'll serve is to ruin the film for you. Mm-hmm. That's all it'll do. So don't be an asshole. After you see the film, though, you'll be dying for other opinions. You'll want to know what, what people think about it. So Like a drug. See cat- you just don't stop today, do you? See Catfish, fucking watch Catfish, and then come listen to the show. If you, you know what? We have chapters. That's what oh, I'm getting Oh, there we at. go. That's, what I'm, that's why I'm going through this whole thing. So what you're saying is if you don't want the films to be spoiled which we're going to do, we have a chapter menu in your little drop down, and you can skip right onto the girlfriend experience or to the little section at the end where we talk about, hey, what, we did a good job on that one. What are we doing next time? Well, and here's the great thing is that we can, we can kind of tease this now, right? If we can't talk you into skipping, we're going to just discuss escorts, classy, sexy escorts. Porn and stars and escorts. Prostitution. In the of- I don't know why you wouldn't skip to that anyway. Might as well just start there. So use the fucking chapters. All right. Okay, so we're going to start off with Catfish. And the very first thing we're going to say about Catfish mm-hmm. is that in all honesty, we don't know we if don't it's know. true or not. Yeah, we don't know. Uh, we don't have that answer. We're going to treat it kind of like a document. Yeah. I mean, it's a documentary. It says it's a it documentary. It essentially, for the former part of this conversation, it doesn't matter if it's true or not. At the end, we will entertain the question of whether or not it's a hoax. But first, we're going to talk about it as just a really well put together story, whether it be a true story. Or a made-up story. That's entirely unimportant to the first And I know now that we've opened that, that can of worms, for a lot of people, I know you didn't even, like, that question didn't even come uh, to your it, mind. W- that, it, I didn't have time. There right. wasn't no room. <laughs> right. And, and suddenly it was, well, what if this is a, just a really good version of the Blair Witch Project? Right. You know, and that, I'm blowing some people's minds. Other people, they, they want that answer. Some people aren't concerned with that. We're going to get there. Do your very best just to put that question off for a second. Because we have to get to the meat of the film first to even entertain the question in the first place. And I think where a lot of that comes from is how perfect 
of a documentary this is. Yeah. It's just beat by beat. Perfect. Everything unfolds. Absolutely. It's, it's, I mean, it's just so cinematic and all of what goes on is so, it just seems precise. so fucking crazy, but it's one of those things that it almost seems like it couldn't be something mm. that didn't really happen. Right. Right. It, everything that goes on is just so mind blowing and it's right. the kind of mind blowing where you realize this is totally possible. So you start with this, uh, this relationship, this almost pen pal kind of yeah. relationship between Neve and, uh, and this girl, Abby. Yeah. Which is creepy to me. The yeah, first time I saw it and the second, when we watched it again, the second time, the whole fucking movie, whole is super creepy. creepy, but the yeah. first time it's a little weird seeing a grown dude kind of mm-hmm. have any type of correspondence with a young kid. I subscribe to the mindset that somebody my age, somebody mm-hmm. Neve's age has no business. Right. Corresponding on any level with a young person, unless their parent or guardian is in the room or has some persistent knowledge, like if they're babysitting, perhaps. Right, right. But there is no reason for somebody 20, I don't know, how old is he, 27? Something like that. I There's no reason for him to correspond with a girl that it doesn't, is... Something about it seems weird. It's just a little off. And I think it sets the tone for kind of the strangeness of events to unfold but first thing it does and it does so brilliantly is to prove that it's an innocent original yeah. kind of foundation yeah there's a part of me that uh that sort of anti hysteria part of me that resists the inner feeling i get immediately because i get the same feeling oh that's weird that's not okay 20 yeah. something talking to anonymous little girl from across right. the, uh, over the internet yeah. you know all of that cultural stuff tells me that is wrong everything about that says wrong but it's the culture that says that it's not intellectually that there's anything right. wrong about that it's completely innocent it's fine mm-hmm. and so in the in the same way you remember the um the episode of bullshit where the kid is on the subway he's right. hanging out he's fine it's the you know it's the child predator fears about children uh-huh. episode we've talked about that on the show too before where we baby children yeah we don't you know we treat them like there's this kind of innocence that might not actually be there and so I resist that stuff. I go, all right, I feel like this is wrong, but let it go. The film is treating it like it's fine. It has whimsical music behind it. Everything is okay. They're trying to tell a story about, you know, I didn't know anything about what this mm. movie's about. That's what I recommend other people do too, is just go watch the movie. There was a trailer that came out, you saw, that kind of tainted your perception yeah. of what was going to happen. Yeah. And we can definitely get to that when that the moment uh, in the film comes. But in the meantime... I'm watching a movie about, you know, a little girl who paints paintings of a guy who's a photographer. Great. I'm just going to go along with that. Mm-hmm. What would you say then is the first moment where you know something is off, where this isn't a story about that anymore? Well, I think you kind of, you get a lot of introductions to a bunch of the family, mm-hmm. the Facebook family, I think sure, they call yeah. it or something weird like that. But I think the first real moment, have the first time I watched the film. When you watch it the second time, you start picking up on stuff that makes it creepy oh, very yeah. early on. Right from the Particularly beginning. the voice. Yeah. <laughs> Megan to Angela's voice. It yeah. seems like it's the same person on the phone. It's absolutely shocking that the first time it sounds like two different people. Sure. But I think the first moment that something becomes very amiss is when Yaniv, for me it, at least, it's when Yaniv starts getting nervous when they figure out that the songs are just right. YouTube videos and yeah. One Tree Hill soundtracks. Yeah, yeah. Well, you get uh, you get the first song. Uh-huh. And so that's a shock for me when they get that and the song is actually kind of good. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know anything about music, yeah. but it, it doesn't sound awful. Right. And I think, I think more curiously is that it's very well produced. Yeah, right. A small family in Michigan. Sure. I mean, as a musician, you don't get that. You can't do that. Sure. In Michigan. But no, you can't, you just can't do that. Through the wonders of Garage Band, Michael, mm-hmm. you certainly can. It's a guitar and mm-hmm. a girl, though. So you do believe that it's feasible. It's just sure. this amazing talent that you didn't know right. someone had. It's just a, yeah. It's jaw dropping, yes. is what it is. Mm-hmm. And you see that in the movie. You see their reactions, which are perfect. Yes. Because that's right where I was. I mean, there was never really a moment in the film where I wasn't 100% with these three individuals doing exactly you know the the same emotions they're getting out of this that's what i'm feeling whether it's the suspense or just the in the beginning moments wow this is a really good that's actually pretty impressive Mm -hmm. you get that realization right there with them and that's something the film does amazingly 
And so then you find out, well, wait a second, these songs, they appear to be covers of these other songs, which feels a little fraudulent. That's the first time something kind of some well, trust is betrayed. Well, they ask for a cover mm-hmm. originally. Yeah, right. But right. then they find out that the first song that they were sent was also a cover. Well, her other songs online, I guess. Sure, right. Those are the ones that are, yeah, that are covers. And, you know, then they pull it up online and it's an exact recording that's from somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And they choose not to call her out on right. it. But it gets to the point where they, they literally, it's so perfect. It's that smash cut to the uh-huh. YouTube video. Yeah. Oh, it's probably the first hit on the internet smash cut YouTube video. Yep. And that's, I mean, that's perfect. You have this, uh, you know, this video, which is upping the ante because we just had recordings before. And that's actually what he's asking from the other computer. He looks up and goes, are you just playing that off her, her page? Or are you just, where is that coming from? Only to find that on the, um, on the other guy's screen, it's actually a video. The, right. You've completely upped the ante. There's no room for argument at this point. Right. It's a live recording of someone else. And then he like corresponds with, I think it's supposed to be Megan on the right, internet. Right. And she still holds the fact that, that she recorded them. She takes the credit for all the compliments. And this is when he starts. He wants to bail at yeah. this point. Yeah. He immediately speculates that there is no Abby at all. Yeah. Because he's never that Abby is the one he's never had a conversation with. Right, right. So he immediately speculates Abby's not real and there's something absolutely amiss with what's going on. Right. And I mean, yeah, he's right. Well, that's when they have to make the choice. Right. Right. Where they have to say, All right, look, we've caught her in a lie. Now, as filmmakers, they've been doing video of this stuff up until now. They say, Well, we can make a decision here. Mm-hmm. We can choose to Ignore it, fuck you, cut off the relationship. They right. kind of bail on the entire project, yeah. essentially. And they make fun of that, saying that the the family will then say you're the crazy one right. and you sure. whatever. And, you know, that's kind of their excuse for not doing it. But they also know that the other route is something interesting. Let's just take this to its logical end. Let's push it as far as we can mm-hmm. go. And something interesting might come of it. Well, they're playing a game right. at that point. Sure. You know, and then they get the piano song back. Yeah. And the piano song is the point where it's, that's the first miserable disappointment. That's right. when you've caught someone in a lie, you've decided not to call them out on it, which is what I would do. Uh-huh. I would call them out on it because yeah. I'm a, a weak person right. and that feels more right. honest to me and I just don't have the adventure spirit that they do. Uh-huh. But instead, they almost perform what's a lie themselves in realizing this and continuing on so that they can build a trap. Sure. And they catch her in it with the fucking piano song. Right. Well, and then the next step is when they decide, oh, right. Abby just bought this gallery. Yeah. Maybe, you know, I'll go online and see if there's like some real estate thing. And they go online Mm -hmm. and they find out, okay, so this is at first it seems like a reprieve from all of the deceit. Yeah. Because they find out. Yeah. They find out. And not only does it exist, but it was for sale. Yeah, they start doing for their the homework. price that they said and everything. Mm-hmm. But then they realize that it's still for sale, right? And there's for some reason pictures of a little girl in what is possibly the old J.C. Penny, as yeah. the guy, the realtor, calls it. <laughs> yeah, and that's when they realize that that place is still up for sale. They call the guy. He says, "Yeah, no, it's still for sale." So as they're doing this, and this is something else that's that's strange and. A reason we should not be taken as an authority on anything. But we haven't done the research here. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how hard it would be to really pin down. I mean, I assume that if this had been verified as a hoax, we'd be able to find that. Sure. And I'm pretty trusting of the filmmakers. And Uh again, it's hard not to bring up this hoax conversation over and over. And we'll really dive into it later. But they're showing street locations, addresses, names. They're using Google Earth and Google Maps. And they're not wiping out the streets. I mean, you could clearly verify for yourself that these places exist. You could look up and call that same fucking real estate guy. But it does make you wonder, especially the second time through, this stuff hasn't been omitted. And what does that mean? Does that mean it's completely fabricated so it's safe for them to release? Does it mean that they're careless filmmakers, which is just an equal uh, possibility? Or does it mean, uh, as you've pointed out to me before, that that shit's on the internet so they don't really have to remove it anyways? I mean, it's kind of fair game once it's posted there. They seem to be very, uh, very careful in kind of honoring the family once the film is over and right. saying thank you to everyone for allowing us to use stuff. So it's very odd to me that he goes on his Mac, he opens up a dress book, and he, uh, he searches Megan. And not only does his Megan come up, 
but all of these other Megans, which I assume are real people in his address book that you can now look up on the internet. Mm -hmm. We haven't done that because we're on a time crunch and we're putting together a show and we're fucking lazy. But other people can go out there and do the same homework that these guys did in the film about them themselves. Right. And, you know, just in the same way that they're kind of trying to track down these individuals and figure out if this is fraudulent, mm -hmm. other people can do that too. Right. So I don't think it's it's really worth it for us to go through the pains of doing that homework. But should people decide they want to do that for themselves, maybe they hard. get some more information. It's not hard. And email us and we'll figure it out yep. on the year end episode. Great. Uh, double feature show at gmail.com. So this is the moment where things start to get really heavy really fast. Right. And there's this there's this thing that that approaches shortly thereafter they decide to go up to Michigan and they Yeah, pass, they're just going to go. They pass a bunch of familiar suburbs to us on right. their GPS. And God, and doesn't that happen fast? Yeah. That's a moment in the film where I think to myself, we're going to Michigan already. Aren't we going to play with this a little bit more? Well, but see that's the thing is like I think they want the answer more than they are really interested in putting together a a great film, a gradient, you yeah. know, they're not worried about putting a slow and suspenseful incline together. Sure. They want information at this point. When I think that's one of the things that makes it such a great film is that, you know, you always want to leave your audience wanting more, but in this case, I mean, it's more of everything. You want the documentary to be longer. Mm -hmm. You want more answers out of it. You can't get the answers fast enough. Once they start coming, you just want to be in that house. You want to find everything out. Sure. So this is another moment where I feel exactly the way the filmmakers do, where they all turn to each other and they say, well, fuck, we should just go right. up to, why don't we do that right yeah. now? And they realize, and you see that fucking realization on their face. You see, wow, that's a big step to just go up there and do it and, and then we'll find out. And they realize, you know what? There's nothing stopping us yeah. from doing it. I guess we just go up there now and we do it, right? right? And there's one more thing that happens before the answers just come like a deluge. And it's the moment from the trailer. Right. So I went to see Piranha 3D in the theater mm -hmm. because, come on. Of course you do. And one of the trailers that went on before Piranha was for Catfish. Yeah. I thought it was a bad pun. That's possibly what someone else was thinking. That sounds like a producer, right? Sure. Right. So I'm seeing this gore fest of a horror flick. Okay. Mm -hmm. Remake of the old Joe Dante, Roger Corman, Piranha. Right. And... I'm watching these trailers for other horror films. There's the new Guillermo del Toro and whatever the fuck. I don't even care. But I see Catfish come on and the trailer ends with this moment that happens right here in the film where mm -hmm. they go to the horse farm and they pull up to the barn and they get out and it's all dark. It's 2.30 in the morning and they go up to the, the front door of this barn and they look inside and in the trailer it just kind of fades this text just comes over the screen. It's a, it's like a quote from like a film review. perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it says the last 40 minutes of this documentary are like nothing you've ever seen. Yeah, sure. Or will make you very uncomfortable. Yeah. Or something. Yeah, I don't remember exactly what it is either, but, but I looked at the trailer. After essentially I saw it what and, it yeah. said to me was, wow, they are going to get their asses tortured yeah sure. inside that barn yeah but that doesn't happen yeah and a lot of people were really because i think that's how the movie was marketed a lot of people were upset by this you know and i, th I think what it actually delivers is far superior to yeah, it, it is. a bludgeon fest mm -hmm. or some kind of a you know torture barn documentary which right. i don't even know why people were expecting that when you really think about how would that there's not enough torture have... barn documentaries is why that's true you that's tell true. somebody a torture barn documentary something is out, i've never seen before everyone will show up and in retrospect looking at that trailer i think it might be the best thing the movie could have done mm -hmm. because this really is you know this gets said a lot about movies and maybe it's true i we love to go to movies we know nothing about but this really is one of those movies that your enjoyment of it is exponentially better if you have no idea what's going on. And so they had to create this trailer that evokes some kind of mood or gets some crowd of people to show up. That's the point of the trailer. But if you say anything about it, anything more than, oh, friendship, Facebook, whimsical, what is something bad's going to happen? And that's about as far as you can go. Mm -hmm. So you have to misdirect people a little bit, but they do get that tense feeling that the trailer promised. So looking back on it, I think it's perfect, although I'm, I, everyone's completely justified in being angry right. that the film's not you know, what they were advertised. But I think that's what trailers should do. They should advertise different films than the ones they trick you into seeing. I want to be tricked into seeing every goddamn movie I go to.
So they actually go to crash the breakfast. And this is the barn moment you didn't get. Right. When they finally show up, they get the microphone clipped on, and you're just thinking, you know, you're ringing that doorbell, and I can't remember another moment in any film ever where I wasn't, I mean, I'm, you know, almost literally standing on the, the fucking couch going, you know, pulling my hair out thinking, what the fuck? Just open the door. I want to know. This is driving me nuts. And it just slowly, you know, the way they present it in the documentary mm-hmm. is great because everybody's kind of behind trees and there's obstructions right. and they have this camera out. They can't quite always use. It's awkward. And so you're kind of seeing somebody, somebody comes out of the door, somebody answers, what the fuck is going on in there? And then uh, it's Vince, right? Right. Yeah. Vince comes up and kind of invites them in and there's this awkward greeting. The whole time, the documentary makers are sort of looking at each other, one sitting in the car looking looking on, but the two of them are just looking at each other like, what's going to happen? What the fuck? And right. they can't say anything because sure. everybody's standing right there. They get in this house. First of all, uh, Megan's not there. Uh-huh. Abby's, Nor does she exist. Abby's not there. <laughs> right. Right. And so, you know, somebody's being called on the phone. They still don't know what's real or what's not. They thought they would just get all the answers mm-hmm. right at the door. And uh, and they're not getting a lot of answers, but they get in there and it gets weirder, right? Because Angela doesn't look like what she's supposed to look At like. All. Vince, nobody even knows what was going on there. There's uh, the two handicapped Wins. brothers. Yeah. And that just comes out of fucking left field. You see that and it's like, this is starting to get extremely weird. And, you know, when they come back to the car to, to brace their other friend, that's immediately what they tell them. You know, here's, I don't even know where to start. That's, I mean, that's the feeling you have. Mm-hmm. Where do you even start to describe a fucking scene like right. this? So this is where we start just, it's answers from here on out. It's yeah. answers all the way down. But the thing that kind of gets strange is that the jig is up, right? Yeah. For Angela, there is no, she can't lie anymore. Well, it's a bittersweet moment for her because right. they're there now. She wants them to stay desperately, as they point out. But also, she knows that, that the game is over. Right. And so it turns out, first she says Megan is real. She just went downstate because she's an alcoholic. Right. Then it turns out Megan's not real. Turns out Abby doesn't paint. She just starts lying. It's really odd that she just continues to lie in a situation where it's honestly in her best interest to just come out with everything. Yeah. And you realize at this point that she's been assuming the role of 15 people. Yeah. And furthermore, that her husband is totally oblivious to it. Yeah, right. And... He's just kind of trying to support her the best he can in the given situation. Yeah. And you can't hate her. No. You kind of pity her. Right. And they do too. And once again, you're exactly, you know, you're aligning perfectly with the filmmakers. Right. And it's really one of those things where the more you kind of see it happen, the more you kind of watch the interaction there, the more you realize that it's probably weirder than whatever horror sci-fi craziness you were expecting to happen. Right. Because... It's, we, we, it's a different kind of weird. Yeah. You see the brothers and Vince says, uh, what does he say? He's like, where are you staying? Right. And you're thinking, okay, this is some, some Texas chainsaw shit right. that happened in, in here. And it's a different kind of weird that starts happening. A very, a, your guard is down against the type of weird you actually get, mm-hmm. which is this emotionally, I mean, it's, it's sad and it's pathetic, but it's almost a little, I guess I wouldn't call it endearing right. at all. But there's just something that has kind of a pathetic charm yeah. about it. And as you explore that more, it, it starts to hurt. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. What they decide to do once they get there is really smart. I mean, they have this, this final sort of confrontation. They have the perfect part where they do this. There's moments where they kind of come together. They can talk about this a little bit. We see the conversations. We see them in the car. They're on the beach. And then the confrontation happens, you know. When they're not going to be interrupted, it's just the two of them. It happens very delicately in the way that it should when they're, you know, out watching these horses or whatever. And then there's, you know, there's the drawing. There's the scene of the drawing of the painting, you know, where he's asking, I mean, in that same confrontation, we're starting to get details. It's almost boring. It's almost, well, those, it's mundane, I guess is the right word. It's okay. Well, you made all the people up, whatever. And you're starting to think, well, that's the end of the story. That's everything's okay then. I guess she made some people up and she's a mm. weirdo. And then they ask her to, and this is such a smart move, they ask her to talk to him in the Megan voice. Mm-hmm. And that's when the human aspect of this right. comes back and you start to fucking feel for these people yep. again. You start saying, well, wow, that, that really, it becomes a lot more real for mm-hmm. you. You hear the fucking voice right there 
and it's it's a little more tangible. It's a little more. It's happening all over again. Mm-hmm. And the way both of them just just lose it. He realizes this isn't a person he'll ever speak to, but at the same time, he's meeting the person he had all those encounters with. And uh, it's just, it's fucking rough. So obviously the the movie gives you a couple of quick wrap-up answers at the end. Um, we've been mentioning this whole time we're going to talk about this hoax stuff. So uh, what the fuck, Michael? What the fuck, movie? Okay, so we really, we have no idea whether this is true. And like we said, that's not the bulk of what's going on with the film. The biggest, and honestly, the reason that we find it the most difficult to believe that this is a real true story is because it's so good. It really is so perfect. And it's put together so ideally and plotted absolutely the way that the best film plots will unfold. You know what I think is a good representation is the moment that, you know, they're talking about how well orchestrated Angela's lie is the Dawn farms lie, Mm -hmm. right? Because they, they, they feel some emotional connection and at the same time, they can't disprove it. And they're under some kind of misdirection so that their anger and suspicion is put out of mind by how bad they should feel for her problem. Right. And it lines up under the, the characteristics you've been given. You see that she's drinking all the time in her Facebook photos and everything is very convenient and makes a lot of sense. And you feel you almost feel guilty for being suspicious, mm-hmm. which is how I feel about Catfish. Yep. And I want to give it the benefit of the doubt. But that's one of those things where if there's anything to me that raises skepticism about the film, uh, because we also need to be skeptical about the idea that it's a hoax. This could go either way. Right. Uh, but what raises skepticism about the, the film being sincere is that it's so perfect. So perfect. It seems like it could have only been that way, well, let's say by design, right? Which, as we know in biology, is um, irrational and incorrect and a, a path of faulty logic that mm-hmm. people fall in. Something must have been designed because it just looks so great. The other possibility, right, is that this is a documentary that is talked about very often because it's just really fucking good. Right. Because all the pieces did fall in place for these people. They got lucky in the right spots and they knew their shit in other spots where they could craft something great out of this. Mm -hmm. Not all the moments need to line up exactly right because you can do some of that in editing. You can uh, add a lot of things in, in post. You know, one of the things I hear people say all the time is that, oh, you know, in Catfish, why were they even filming this from the beginning? And I don't think that's, I mean, it's certain, certainly not something I question at mm, all. No, I don't that know if didn't you, cross my mind. That seems plausible. They're art kids. Sure. Art kids will fucking film anything. Well, it, it's not like it starts at the very beginning of right. the correspondence between Neve and Andy. It starts in the middle of it. It starts after the first few paintings have been done. Yeah, he's getting gifts for months before they even start filming mm-hmm. anything. And you have to remember that, you know, first of all, it doesn't seem like a stretch living with two filmmakers that they record a few conversations here or there of things that seem interesting to them. And then a lot of the footage, or at least some of the footage, I guess I should say, at the beginning is retelling. Mm -hmm. It's, well, where do you think the story should start? It's, you know, on this day, I got this contact and this happened. It's not till you start hearing the live phone calls that that stuff is, you know, they're shooting it as it's happening. A lot of it is they don't have, and that's probably where the huge jumps in story come from too, why they just decide all right, we got to go to Michigan because they don't have a lot of stuff before that. Mm -hmm. It hasn't really heated up before that. And a lot of it probably isn't very interesting, you know, by comparison of what they end up getting. But then on the flip side of that, you know, as we've talked about the second time through, it seems creepier to me, but it also seems more perfect. I guess more fake. Do you get that feeling too? You start to really see where that orchestration comes through. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I guess, are you, are you more suspicious of it the second time around or did did that I mean, change I'm, your impression at all? I think I'm a little bit more suspicious, but honestly, like I just, I, like I said at the very beginning, I don't care if it's a hoax or not. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I'm just kind of, I, I guess it'd be one of those things where like, I'd be curious to know the answer, but it, it won't affect my perception of the film really. Well, it's remember back when we did uh, Michael Moore hates America and there mm. was that great quote. Uh, I think it was at the end, um, the Pendulette quote. Talking about once you turn the cameras on, it's not a documentary anymore anyways. Right. And so I guess I would agree with you uh, on that, maybe for different reasons. But anytime I'm seeing a documentary, I'm more interested in what they're telling me. Right. And if some of it's fabricated, I mean, the truth is important, but I accept that films lie to me. I mean, Angela and Vince, Vince especially, those guys would have to be 
the greatest actors right. of all time sure. to pull off those. The the documentary, the filmmakers, you know, I could go either way with uh, whether or not they're actors or mm-hmm. whatever, but the family, I mean, that's hard to believe, uh, really, to yeah. believe that those guys are actors. Right. But once again, on the opposite end, the anecdote about Catfish is really well-placed. Mm-hmm. I mean, really well-placed. Yeah, but I don't think that they named the movie Catfish prior to that no, Well, of course, of course. So, you know, that's that's an excellent counter to that. Of course, that's where they got the, the name of the film from. And they found, amongst all the footage they got, that one thing actually described, right. you know, what was happening here pretty beautifully. And maybe they kind of, oh, I was going to say baited. Oh, that would be really bad. But I don't have a better, maybe they kind of baited Vince into saying that. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Maybe they sort of needed, you know, when you're doing those one-on-one interviews like that, you hear them asking questions. Yeah. You know, they're obviously trying to drag certain pieces of information out that'll be useful to their documentary. Mm-hmm. And so that's less of the lucky stuff that happened to them and more of the, hey, we have a lot of planning and we're right. trying really hard to make some kind of story out of this. And the other thing, you have those texts too. You remember yeah. the text yeah. message conversation? A little embarrassing, huh? Right. That's the kind of thing that, I mean, that says something about it being genuine for me because it's this sort of conversation I mean, I think that's pretty universal. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I just happened to. Yeah. To no, of, I think I think it is. <laughs> we both kind of embarrassingly go, "Yep, that happens sometimes." Mm-hmm. Um, you have these message exchanges with people, these flirtatious. I mean, uh, more when I was younger or whatever. But that's the kind of stuff you don't really want people to see. That it's not something that I would write into a fictional movie as a realistic thing that happens right. because it's this sort of embarrassing just you can see the reaction on your faces as i mean as he's reading it Uh you know just thinking all right i have to do this for the documentary this is really fucking awful and i have a hard time believing if they wrote it they were really smart and good job for them and you know if not that's another great reason this isn't fabricated so one other note i want to make about the hoaxes and then we can finally move on to the uh the girlfriend experience is um, I've talked to about a million people about Catfish uh-huh. because, like I said, I saw it by myself. Did you see it with other people? Yeah, I watched it with a bunch of people. Yeah, so, I mean, you had some people to kind of turn to and figure out what the hell. Uh-huh. I had nothing. I watched well, it I on watched my own. I watched it with a bunch of nuts. people who were all disappointed that it wasn't a horror movie. Oh, well, fuck those people. Yeah. So I run out into the world screaming. I just bolt out of my apartment and start shouting at people on the street, have you seen Catfish? Which didn't turn up a lot of results. And you got but shot at. I did... Uh, I did manage to find some other people and convince them to watch the movie. Uh-huh. And I've, I've been having these conversations nonstop trying to figure out the hoax thing's a big question for me just because I want to know the answer. Yeah. As you've said over and over, not that it fucking matters at all, but I, I just want to know. Right. I'm interested in filmmaking. So, of course, if this is happening, I mean, it could be part of this huge wave of these films that are coming out. These, um, I, I think Eber described them as prankumentaries. Yeah. Uh, he was talking in particular about the Banksy film, Exit Through the Gift Shop, as a film that may itself be a hoax, and that might be saying something larger, you know, about the audience or about what's happening there. It's just a little too perfect. You have that uh, Casey Affleck thing. I keep yeah. forget the Joaquin Phoenix. I'm still here. And everybody kind of knows like that. that was set up and whatever. But, um, you know, this film draws a lot of stuff from Tall Hot Blonde, which is another movie that talks about a uh, an online relationship that was kind of weird. And that's obviously, that movie is made so poorly that mm-hmm. it has to be real. There's just a lot of these are they or aren't they real kind of things yeah. cropping up at once. And a lot of the conversation I've been having with people are about the camera work. So you notice as you go through, and maybe I just I pay more attention to this. I don't know if that was something that you kind of thought, well, mm-hmm. where did these cameras have to be at this moment? But there are uh, there's certain parts where they're filming on these shitty flip cameras, mm-hmm. or they're filming on a on a little uh, you know point and shoot photo camera, and especially when they first meet Angela, they're trying to. The question becomes: How are they getting video of her without her knowing for the documentary? How are right. they able to compose shots and frame this stuff? And you know, I did. Um, I remember because we were, this actually came out while we were doing the show. You remember the the bootleg thing, the yeah. TBM DVD? Yeah. I shot some video footage for uh, a Canadian band. And because of, you know, content restriction, legal nonsense, blah, blah, I wasn't able to shoot at a lot of the places. They didn't let you in with cameras, but they didn't really give a shit if video came out afterwards. 
And so I had to sneak footage to a lot of these places. And the band was also really, really shy about video. So you didn't get a very natural kind of, Uh you know, anything out of them if they knew you were shooting. So it's really hard to shoot video without people knowing. Yeah. But I think when you do it a lot, you get used to it. I mean, I certainly was able to get used to it, and I don't know anything about yeah. filmmaking in a very short period of time. Mm-hmm. And I feel like if these guys, you know, are filmmakers, have been doing this kind of stuff, if they're the kind of people who could come up with this plan in the first place, I think that they could certainly spy cam their way through it right. until they could get to a point where, you know, at the end they have the very professional looking cameras. Um, I just want to add my two cents to that conversation because there's a lot of nonsense that flies around about. How could this have possibly been right. done? And I would at least venture to bet that that's not, you know, if it's a hoax, that isn't the reason why. But still really interested in this double feature show at gmail.com. All right. So now we have the girlfriend experience, which really could be retitled as the girlfriend experiment or the girlfriend experience experiment. There'd be too many eyes. E's then. Uh, experiment's a fair word. We're going to just keep using it. I feel like a lot of what went on with this film is kind of trying stuff out, seeing if it worked, seeing what would happen if you did something like cast a famous porn star in your sure. film. Honestly, that's why I heard about the movie. Yeah, that's probably why most people I heard that about Sasha Gray was going to be in a film where she wasn't getting fucked. She was in that uh, series of shorts we talked about before. Right. Fucking Machines. Right. It's Excellent called... web series. You Absolutely. should Google that, not yeah. at work. But she's the star of the film. She is the girlfriend experience. She's the mm. title character. Were you familiar with that term before the film? No. Yeah. So that's is that a, a term? Yeah, that's a thing. Oh, I had um, no idea. It's a whole kind of niche of uh, prostitution where people are paying for the girlfriend experience, TGE, it's uh, shortened to. And it's people who pay specifically not just for sex, but for someone to kind of go shopping with and take out to dinner. It's usually they're paying them so that they can treat them to nice things Uh as if they had a girlfriend, the girlfriend experience. Right. So this film kind of explores at a base level. It's about being a call girl, Mm -hmm. but it's more kind of focused on entrepreneurship um, as an independent. And it's, there's a lot to do with the stock market and all of the, the financial stuff that was happening at the time. Right. When I think you hit it talking about some of that experimental stuff, I know you're not a big Steven Soderbergh guy. Yeah, I'm not crazy about him. I went through uh, through a little marathon trying to figure out Steven Soderbergh. Don't know anything about him. What's uh, what's his thing? You know, we talked about VCR filmmakers before when he was part of that, and that really, really interests me. So I went through, and I'm not, you know, a giant fan of his right. or anything, mm-hmm. but I went through and watched a lot of his movies. And having seen The Girlfriend Experience, you just hit on a lot of the staples of his stuff, things he's known for. You know, the girlfriend experience to me will always be the best poster ever. I already described that on another show. While we're, you know, while we're nailing stuff on old shows, the Man on Wire reference. Right, yeah. Which they validated for us, which is nice. Uh Uh-huh. Because they start talking about, oh, it's a documentary, something, heist film. You don't even know if they're going to get in or whatever. And I'm thinking, that sounds a lot like Man on Wire, which they name dropped later. Mm -hmm. So trying to remember that this isn't a documentary, which is hard after Catfish, uh, especially with Soderbergh's style. He films a lot of it, especially that stupid fucking airplane scene that drives me nuts, right. with the camera swinging back and forth as if it's, you know, as if it's a documentary. Sure. That's what he's trying to show you is kind of a day in the the lives of these people. Right. But if we could stop for a second and I'll kind of run down some Soderbergh stuff here. Yeah, go ahead. He's got a really weird um, variety of films that he's done for a pretty specific reason. Soderbergh has made a lot of big budget movies so that he could finance or, you know, get a studio to back right. different independent projects. Kind of like the Gus Van Sant thing. Yeah, a little bit like that. Although I think Gus did a lot of independent stuff and then did some really big budget stuff for whatever reason and okay. kind of came back to that. Uh, Soderbergh is almost, I mean, he'll make a little pocket of independent films and then he'll do a big budget one and then he'll do a couple more independent and then another, I mean, it's like clockwork. You know, he did the uh, the Ocean's Eleven remake. And then he did Ocean's 12 and mm-hmm. Ocean's 13. After doing a couple independent things, another Ocean's movie, a couple independent things, he did Aaron Brockovich, mm-hmm. which was a huge fucking movie. So we know what it looks like when Steven Soderbergh just Sells out. makes a fun, you know, caper film. Sells out. With Brad Pitt and Matt Damon and Sells out. nine other 
people sells out i don't know if you can sell out if you do it consistently every three films is that really selling out at that point he comes back and makes the girlfriend experience no that's i understand you can you can unsell out you can buy back in but then eventually he's selling back out turns out the film industry is about money I mean, that's what the that's what this fucking movie's about. Yeah, right. It's about money. It's about earning the money when you need it, where you need it, by doing what you want to do. Although, oddly, it never focuses on what you want to do when you get to the money. Well, because the I think the kind of the whole basis is that you never really get to the money. And by the time you get to the money, you're alone and you have to pay right. for sex. And <laughs> you've done that is, that's been your life. John McCain. Oh, I'll never get tired of bitching and moaning about John McCain. You know, he whistles when he talks. It's just so annoying if I have to listen to one Don't more vote of for him. He whistles. Goddamn debates. I'm sorry. He's a maverick. Did you vote for John McCain? No. Did you vote for Obama? Nope. I'd give you some kind of high five, but we're so far away from each <laughs> other right now. All right, but Soderbergh's made some awesome films, uh, or at least extremely interesting double feature worthy films. You know, he did Sex, Lies, and Videotape. Everybody's heard of that, even if they haven't Nobody's seen, seen it. Nobody's seen it. It's, uh, I think a lot of people have seen I, it, but no, not as many yeah. as talk about it. Mm-hmm. And then he did Bubble. Bubble is probably one of my favorite ones. Um, Traffic, Full Frontal, he did the remake of Solaris. Does a lot of stuff with George Clooney. Mm-hmm. And uh, these are all tiny films he does by, you know, doing these big budget ones. Pretty sure Traffic won a bunch of Oscars. Yeah, they do often win awards. It's not... When I say independent, I don't mean lesser known. Okay. Because people who know about Soderbergh stuff, they know about the little ones. They know about Traffic and Solaris. <laughs> right. Right. They talk about those films quite a bit. Independent and they, wide release. They ignore the uh, they ignore the big budget ones when they come out or try and justify them to themselves. Mm-hmm. So what I want to do with this movie is, uh, you know, the movie's begging for it. It's asking for you to answer this series of questions. Uh-huh. And I know there's a, a defiant streak in you, and myself as well, really. Yeah. That kind of bulks at a movie that's that sets up all these pretentious art questions and shows people staring at paintings and galleries. Yeah. And I, I kind of just want to perform the experiment. Yeah, that's fine. If he's going to make an experimental film, girlfriend all right, fuck experience it. experiment. All right, we'll do it. First, I did want to point out one other cool Soderbergh thing. So he, um, he shot this movie on a red camera, on a red one. I don't know that we've ever talked about this. I don't think before. we have. So these red cameras, all right, it's going to be film geekery time. I apologize. But these red cameras are full-fledged, uh, they're called 4K movie cameras. They shoot at 4,000 by whatever resolution. They're huge, huge, huge images. So you get the kind of resolution you would expect from a really professional, I don't know, $50,000 movie camera. But you get it for somewhere between fifteen dollars and $20,000. When I said $50,000, that might even be a, a low yeah. kind of estimate. But I mean, you can shoot a Hollywood movie on these. And in fact, a lot of Hollywood movies get shot on these now for really cheap, which allows you to make a more independent production to keep your costs down. And of course your costs down means your, your artistic freedoms higher in what you can get away with shooting a movie like the girlfriend experience that otherwise might not have gotten made. I mean, it would have because it's Soderbergh and he found a way before this, but you're able to, uh, to shoot on a lot tighter budget. And these cameras are really small. They shoot straight to digital, so there's no kind of film conversion, mm-hmm. anything involved. You can pop the stuff out of here right into Final Cut, just plug it into a, a fucking consumer-grade computer, and drag it right into your project and just get editing right there. It makes dailies really easy. Swapping in and out accessories is really simple. The only kind of downside is, and, and this has been fixed since then, but you can see this with the girlfriend experience. You get When you shoot on um, digital like this, it seems really the the definition doesn't seem to you know what I mean. Yeah. It's kind of I don't want to say it's blurry because mm-hmm. that's not what it is, but there's um there's a certain clean look to it that yeah. doesn't quite feel. Maybe it's because we're watching gritty films all the time. Right. It doesn't feel quite as dirty as it should be. Uh-huh. It doesn't feel as sharp as right. it should be. And as people have been using the red ones over the last couple of years, they've gotten really good. I mean, he shot Che Soderbergh shot that uh-huh. uh, that two part Che thing on red one and that certainly looks a lot different and now you know every other movie is is shot on these things they're doing really really well but to think uh maybe not this this poor uh poverty stricken show of ours could buy one but it's not too far out of reach Mm -hmm. for someone like you or i if we were die hard into making films to collect enough money to buy one of these cameras and start shooting on something that could be projected in a theater could make its way to a high definition release. 
it's putting a lot more power into the hand of the average consumer. And that's cool to me because it means more people can make films, more interesting people can make films. A lot of people these days are shooting on um, DSLRs, yeah. which are basically, you know, they're uh, photography cameras, right? you know, the, the Canon Mark D kind of stuff or, uh, or the 60 where they will, you know, they're meant for taking photographs, but they'll shoot film as well. They'll shoot 1080p film. They'll shoot at 24 frames a second. And those things, I mean, we're talking under $5,000. I mean, you could feasibly shoot on, a, on maybe a $1,000, maybe $2,000 camera, which even people in Uptown, not most people in Uptown, but some people in Uptown could feasibly afford. Mm-hmm. And they look a lot better, too. One day, maybe on uh, you know year seven of double feature, enough people will be shooting with DSLRs. We'll actually find something interesting shot on there a DSLR go. that we can do on the show and kind of look at that. Fingers crossed. All right. So first thing, this movie begs the question. Yeah. Uh, the, it's called The Girlfriend Experience. Uh-huh. It's Sasha Gray. Right. Uh, there's also a dude selling sports equipment, right. something. And uh-huh. what the hell is that guy doing in here? He's being a douchebag. All right. Um, so the film wants you to ask, what is the purpose? Sure. The duality of the two characters. What is their... Maybe not their relationship because they fuck uh-huh. each other and live in the same apartment. That's their relationship. But uh, why show the other story? I think essentially what it is is to kind of contrast and compare the call girl entrepreneurial lifestyle to the personal trainer entrepreneurial lifestyle. Right. They're it's business. To kind of, yeah. It's to kind of go, yeah, well, you know, they're both just businessmen. They're both doing the same thing. They're both just trying to make it, mm-hmm. make money you know, get their name out there, be somebody that other people want to have doing whatever it is their profession is for them. And you will argue that the dude is far more of a douchebag, unethical bastard than she ever will be. And I agree. Fully. Do you think maybe it's to make her look ethical by comparison? I think, yeah, I think it's to make her look like a, I think it's to, Upstanding to citizen. bring out, well, it's to bring out the business and to kind of bury the whole fact that she's having sex for money because- that's always going to be sure. So it's to taboo. emphasize on business, yeah. yeah. Because they're not they're not cheating by any means. It's not like they're showing a drug runner and a prostitute, mm-hmm. or a warlord and a prostitute. They're showing somebody who you know tries to sell passes at gyms and a prostitute. And I feel like that's sleazy. A lot of people don't feel like it's sleazy. I think any time you're trying to convince someone instead of buying five passes now, buy twenty five or fifty passes, so you'll be set. The entire business model is that you're hoping they won't return to right. take advantage of that, so you will have made more money. Mm-hmm. I mean, the whole thing feels sleazy, but I'm not going to go on a rant about how gym memberships are a right. sleazy industry. That's probably for the best. You know what I think is interesting about that is they're both selling something you could get for free. Yes. Now, these aren't things that are easy to get for free. Right. A lot of people lack the motivation to work out, mm-hmm. and a lot of people can't find a partner to have sex with. So here's an industry based on stuff that if you were super motivated yourself or you tried really hard or you lowered enough of your standards, you could probably find someone to sleep with and you could more than likely get your ass to walk around a little bit more, burn more calories Mm -hmm. than you consume. But some people want help with these things. Sure. I don't... um, Well, some people don't want to go through all the work they'd have to do. They kind of want to take a shortcut. They want to... They're willing to pay the extra dough... In order to take the shortcut because they have it. And you see that particularly with her customers. Right. That they, you know, these are guys who are really well off Mm -hmm. uh, financially. They seem to work in markets where they're really, really busy. That's what the higher end clientele tends to be. And so they don't want to bother. They're traveling a lot. They're going to a new city. They don't want to go to a social club and flash around their money. They just want to get laid now. And I have no problem with that. No, me neither. What makes me feel like she's a bit more ethical is that her service is very upfront about what it's offering. It's very, you will give me money and I will have sex with you and or, you know, go out on dates with you. I mean, it's very cut and dry about what you're getting. Whereas he seems more like a kind of a sleazy salesman. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just put my stuff on the rack for a year and I know it'll sell. You know, I'm going to go to this this, uh, Vegas thing. Everything those Vegas guys are talking about with the financial sector seems kind of... It seems cynical. It seems a little underhanded. You know, her stuff is even the even the stuff she has these terrible uh, misgivings about the astrology thing, or mm. uh, what does she even call it? It's like personality. Uh, just, let's right? just call it astrology because it's bullshit. Turns out astrology that is total bullshit. But star charts or signs or whatever, you know, 
it's not cynical. It's just wrong. Uh-huh. It's still about uh, which people you know, coincide with each other the best, which people can communicate, can have the best relationships. But even the stuff she's doing that's straight out fucking stupid, there's still something good natured about it. Right. So then I think the point is to talk about, I hesitate to use this term, but I guess we might as well because everyone else does. The human experience. Yeah. Have you ever seen or heard about a film that illustrated the human experience? The human centipede. Yeah, this is, no, I don't think that's what that was. No. Um, you know, we're going to have to do that on the show eventually. We'll see. People just keep emailing us. We'll see. You know, if they want, they can send a goddamn donation and maybe they could pick out the human centipede at the end. How are we tagging the human centipede in the girlfriend experience show? Oh man. The idea of these movies is that you're simply going to hang out with a character. You're going to uh, act as a, a fly on the wall to a lot of people. They might, and maybe even rightfully so call those movies dull or boring. Are they worthless, do you think? Is no. there a, a point to that? I think they're at le- they're trying to illustrate a point. They're trying to kind of say, I don't know, I think they're saying somewhere in this movie they're trying to make a point that just because she does what she does, she's still a human being. Mm-hmm. She's still susceptible to, you know, the misleadings of her affections and right, she's right. still susceptible to making wrong decisions and she's still susceptible to being hurt. She just happens to have sex for money. Right. And I think that's essentially what the human experience level of this film Mm -hmm. is saying. But at the same time, like, you know, they all kind of chalk up to the same message, which is people are all just living. Mm -hmm. I I don't know how many more times I need to see that in a film, but it's never wasted on me. It's never lost on me. I mean, I get that every once in a while they decide that that's a point they're going to hit home. I mean, I guess it boils down to a a really basic fundamental question, which is, do you need to shadow one of these people for a day or for an an episode of their life? You know, if you're the kind of person who's interested in the business side uh, of the girlfriend experience, or maybe someone, you know, I think that this is an easy one for a lot of people because they don't know what the life of a prostitute is like. They don't know anything about the call girl industry. And so by watching this, It's essentially, it's almost reading a book, you know, it's almost reading a book written by Sasha Gray's character telling you what it's like in passages. It's almost like she's journaling Mm -hmm. and that's what the movie wants to show you. It wants to normalize prostitution a little bit. And, you know, there's, there's so many uh, misconceptions about it that maybe that by just following a prostitute that we can learn more about that industry. We can see it's almost in a sense, a documentary in that way. It's kind of uh, showing you these things in a fictional setting in a way, it kind of reminds me, you ever see the movie Street Thief? Nope. Okay, Street Thief is a, it's a relatively obscure movie, but it follows this guy who breaks into stores and robs them and, and what have you. And rather than making a documentary, they did all this research and they created a kind of lousy fictional film where, you know, we could get full exposure to what this guy was doing without worrying about the things you'd have to in a documentary. Sure. If we were really following a prostitute like this, we'd have to worry about the anonymity. We couldn't get extremely close to them. We couldn't see what their home life was. They could was. be arrested at any moment. Yeah, yeah, you could not finish your film. <laughs> right, right. And so I feel like my favorite thing about the movie, and I knew this would be super awkward doing it's this. It's okay. So I'm not sure how, how much of this I want to do. I didn't plan very well it's for Sasha this. Sasha Gray's ass, isn't it? So... um. I know someone who's a call girl, actually a, a mutual acquaintance uh-huh. of, of ours, as most of our acquaintances are anyhow. Yeah. And um, especially when they were going through a time, just like Sasha Gray's character, trying to move into the, I guess, the upper echelon, would you say? Sure. Trying to go from, you know, there's these different levels, I guess, when you consider maybe the hierarchy of, uh, of someone who has sex for money. There's people who work in a very impoverished area. And they kind of work for, you know, they have a pimp, sure. right? They're streetwalkers. And so, you know, they work for a lot lower salary. They answer to someone. That's where you typically see a lot of violence in that industry. When people think of, we need to ban prostitution, it's causing all this violence. That's usually what they think. Mm-hmm. And then there's kind of this uh, upper level of people who are self-employed and they can put ads out. They used to be able to put ads out on Craigslist. That was a thriving place for prostitution. A thriving marketplace of prostitution was Craigslist. And then there was that big crackdown that happened on Craigslist Mm -hmm. uh, a few years back. And I think as a result, they just had to remove their their adult section completely. I don't think you can even go on there to hook up anymore. 
Although they do still have, what is that, misconnections? Well, they have misconnections and casual encounters. Do they still have casual I encounters? I so. Exciting. And then I guess beyond that, you start to really, you try and attract higher caliber clientele because you can only make so much money, you know, when you're filling your free time, making these appointments with people, you're still making hundreds of dollars an hour, but you want to be making thousands of dollars mm-hmm. an hour, maybe tens of thousands of dollars an hour when you, when you really get into the higher level of what then becomes kind of a lifestyle. And so the thing I really loved about this movie is that I felt like it accomplished for all the weird experimental things it did. And, and you can argue about whether this thing worked or that thing didn't work yeah. or these questions. If the goal of the movie was to give you an accurate portrayal of this lifestyle, of this business. Of the girlfriend experience. Oh my God, did it do it well. I agree. I mean, stuff down to, uh, you know, they talk about, this is something uh, we can bring in a little bit more home here and talk about our show. They talk about search engine optimization at one point, SEO it's called, which is where you get your site to pop up higher in Google. And you know from our production meetings that even though we sometimes have great double feature ideas, the only reason I'm convinced anyone listens to our yeah. show is because they type some shit into Google and yeah. we pop right up right. at the top. And it's really hard to do. And it's exactly as the guy was describing there. And so it seems to me that they've really done their research. And to me, that's commendable to show uh, the inner workings of a type of job that no one really knows anything about. You know, her clients are normal people, but they're normal in the way that they're not cookie cutter. We're not going out of our way. It's not, you know, housewife in the 50s normal. Right. It's normal where they have social quirks. They have reasons they come to her. Mm -hmm. She gets a lot of people who are, you know, who just want to chat or the guy at the end who just wants to hug and make sort of a sad crying face. Uh And I think, at at least from talking to our acquaintance, you know, from our one uh, bullet points in the, the vast field that this is. Uh, but I, I guess that, no, it's it's the same from a lot of the stuff I've read, too, that you get people who maybe two-thirds want to have sex. They're looking for something, uh, maybe a third of them are looking for something even more brief. And then a good third want to hang out or they want to massage so they can bitch about their job. They just need some kind of stress relief. And especially when you're dealing with people particularly interested in the girlfriend experience, I think a minority of those encounters even involve sex at all. Yeah, I think it's mostly come out to dinner with me. I'm going to bitch about being a stockbroker. Mm-hmm. And then also, you know, maybe we'll fuck at the end. I remember um, talking to this uh, particular girl a few different times about the books she could potentially write or the websites or trying to get reviews. And that it really is what so much of that industry is based around is the reviews and the websites and the accuracy of that. It's almost suspicious to me. It's almost, I mean, how do you, how do you know that stuff? Do you just read about it? They, did these it, people have to know Call Girls? They did get Sasha Gray. I mean, that's true. I'm sure she has some knowledge. You know, she's she done a lot she of interviews about does. this stuff. Yeah, I guess I really wish one of us knew if she's ever worked in that industry. I don't know if she'd even be public about that. But she's done a lot of interviews and uh, kind of awesome. Oh, I yeah. don't know enough about Sasha she's Gray. Great. But, yeah, and knowing about Soderbergh's other stuff, I mean... Uh, employing a lot of times what he calls non-actors, or maybe he doesn't call them non-actors. Maybe I just call them non-actors because I don't else, yeah. know the fucking term. But people that he just sort of finds. Mm-hmm. Finds hanging out around the town, just sort of plugs them into his uh, into his movie. And it's part of that natural idea that they'll just come up and it'll be more genuine and their lines won't be as rehearsed. And, you know, again, always a conversation about for better or for worse, whether that works or not. But I think that certainly makes a much different movie. Definitely a more authentic movie. Yeah. I mean, that's the toss up, right? Mm-hmm. It's more authentic, maybe, but at the risk of shittier acting, maybe. And so here we have some more authentic roles because these people are very often playing parts that they play in real life, things they normally do. And part of that might be that they can lend their insight to that. If she doesn't know about the escort industry, she surely knows about the pornography industry which are a lot closer tied than you might think, you know, offhandedly. Well, it seems like they might be closely tied, but I bet there's a lot of separation when there is a lot of bleed over that happens there too. I was going to ask to address the political climate and the economic issue, Uh but I think we kind of talked about that. Yeah, it's definitely in there. Um, I think it's there because, you know, we're trying, maybe not just to capture a moment in time, which seems to be the most obvious answer, Uh but what you said earlier that we're dealing with the business. Yeah. 
So this is, all right, there's hard economic times. That's what was on everybody's mind at the time. And so we're going to look at the business side of these individual lives. And by focusing on what everyone else is kind of doing, what everyone else is talking about at the time with the election and with the economy, we also get, you know, the unique opinions or lack thereof right. of these characters and what they're doing when times are hard. Mm -hmm. And the question sort of arises, are lots of people doing that now because the times are hard? Right. But you never get a moment in her life where she questions whether or not she should be a call girl. Right. That's not or, part of what's going on. No, not at all. It's not a movie that tries to stake out any moral position on this. If anything, I think it defends her. Yeah. It defends her just by showing how completely normal her life is. And of course, she has problems she has to deal with because everybody has problems at their job. Her problems are obviously more often sexual or relationship wise. It takes an emotional toll because mm -hmm. on a lot of these girls, it does take an emotional toll, but it never preaches at her. It never right. says, you should probably stop becoming a prostitute. I know times are rough, but come on, it's fucking up your life. Right. Okay. We have a website that's doublefeatureshow.com. And I guess that means an email address that would be doublefeatureshow at gmail.com? Yeah, you just add the at gmail in between the double feature show and the dot com. So there's iTunes as well, and there is Facebook. Got yeah. a lot of people showing up on the Facebook. And so we have this donation thing, which I'm just going to let you handle. Okay, so week. it's fairly simple. Donate.doublefeatureshow.com. The idea is that we're going to take two of the people who donate. Those people are going to pick out a couple films, and we're going to pick one of each film. Or pair those films up and do them on, I guess, the last episode of the year, which okay. will be uh, like a year-end listener. It'll, it'll appear just like a regular show, except we'll be a little bit more begrudging about it. And the intro will be different. Yeah, if you go to the website and you click the subscription button on there, if you're one of those people, then you can record a little tiny vocal snippet and we'll replace one of the awesome vocal things in the intro with your awesome thing or your not awesome thing. Donate.doublefeatureshow.com. I wanted to do something a little bit different this week and ask you what two films we're doing next time. Uh, next time we're going to do some horror films for a change. Oh, geez. We're <laughs> just changing everything up on the show. We're going to do, uh, I guess we'll call it old school American horror, right? Great. We're going to do Mulberry Street and Frozen. Frozen, which is Adam Green, who we love from Hatchet way back year one. And Mulberry Street is something you haven't heard of and probably haven't seen, but you should actually look that movie up and watch it. It's really good. Watch more fucking film. Bye.